Excellent. Okay, so this should be working now. Um, so good morning from California. It's six o'clock here. Um, so my name is Brandon Curtis. Um, as you probably figured out, I'm Dr. Curtis's son. Um, I graduated from Penn State in 2011 with degrees in chemical engineering and biochemistry. Um, and today I just wanted to talk a little bit about personal finance, uh, to sort of give you some things to think about. And so uh, you might ask the entirely legitimate question on why you should ask a graduate student in, uh, why you should believe anything that a graduate student in chemical engineering has to say about personal finance. Um, I'm actually in the process of studying for the Uniform Investment Advisor Law Exam uh, to become a registered investment advisor in the state of California. Um, so uh, I've actually spent a couple, probably hundreds if not thousands of hours on uh, learning about personal finance over the last three years. Yeah, but unfortunately we don't have many uh, requirements for personal finance education um, at the middle school and high school level. Uh, so a lot of people don't really learn about these things until they've already been working for a couple years. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a couple different things today. Um, I'll talk about credit and savings and debt um, and taxes and basically how all of this factors into uh, investing and how that's done practically and what the implications of it are. So hopefully, um, now obviously, in 50 minutes, I can't cover even like a fraction of the of this material at any depth. Um, but hopefully, it will inspire you to uh, look into some of the details on your own uh, and learn more about this stuff. Um, and I'll give a bunch of different resources at the end that you can that you can look into. And uh, this presentation as well, I'm going to record, and it will be available. So a little bit of just my historical context. Um, I started at Penn State. Uh, in chemical engineering and biochemistry, and I'm actually in graduate school now at UC Berkeley. Uh, at Penn State, um, I'm actually a state high grad. I grew up in State College. Um, I worked on a lot of biotech-related things. Uh, I published an honors thesis on the production of membrane proteins and bacteria, um, and just sort of worked on a number of biotech-related projects. Um, but now, out at Berkeley, I'm working on plasma physics, um, specifically on the application of plasmas for medical uh, for medical uses, so that just sort of goes to show you you can you can do a you can completely change what you work on uh, really at any time, um, and if you do decide to go to grad school, you can work on anything. Um, so for, at least for the moment, all this finance stuff is just sort of a a fun hobby side project, but we'll see what happens in the future. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about uh, is just a little warning. Uh, that you shouldn't necessarily trust everyone who has advice for you in the world of personal finance. Um, so this important term is fiduciary. Uh, fiducia is Latin for trust. And a fiduciary is a person or a business who has the obligation to basically act for the best interest of a client. Uh, and so you might think that pretty much everyone involved in the personal finance business is going to be acting as a fiduciary and is going to have fiduci uh, a fiduciary duty to the client. It turns out, the lesson one, this is not true. Um, so broker-dealers are actually uh, salesmen who work for brokerage firms, um, and they're actually paid by commissions and kickbacks um, by the companies whose uh, investments and, and things that they sell. Um, so they can make recommendations uh, that aren't necessarily in your best interest, and that's totally legal, and a lot of people get screwed by this. Um, but they're also registered investment advisors and certified financial planners, and they do actually act as fiduciaries, so they legally have to act in your best interest, um, and they're paid by one-time fees and what are called RAT fees. Um, so a one-time fee, maybe you pay an advisor $50 to like go through your finances and, and answer your questions. Um, a wrap fee is, um, so maybe you pay an advisor to manage all of your investments, and you pay uh, like 0.1 or 0.2% of those assets per year. Um, that's called a wrap fee. And uh, anytime you really act with anyone who's, who's going to be giving you financial advice, you should ask them if they're going to be acting as a fiduciary and ask them really how they're paid. Um, because just like in many things, you sort of have to follow the money. Um, if they're getting paid by the companies whose products they're recommending, then you probably shouldn't trust them. 
Uh, so I'm going to make the case that uh, you know, financial ignorance has always been a bad thing, um, but I'm going to make the case that due to a confluence of a bunch of different factors, um, learning about finance is sort of more important than ever. And so the first thing here um, is to look at what's going on with the social security system. So as you've probably heard in the news, um, so on the x-axis here is year from 2005 to 2040, and on the y-axis are the net um, inflows and outflows from social security and Medicare. So in 2007, uh, Medicare's cash flow went negative, and Social Security is uh, expected to go negative in 2017. Um, and you might think, oh, well, you know, there are many years of surpluses if you look back in time. Um, but it actually turns out that um, the politicians already spent all of the surpluses. So all of this money isn't sitting somewhere where it can be dispersed in the future here when we need it. Um, this entire deficit here which is in the hundreds of billions, is going to have to be paid for with increases in taxes and reductions in benefits. Um, so probably a pretty good bet that um, though Social Security is going to be around in some form, it might not be as nice as it has been in the past. Um, and so what this means, coupled with the fact that we're living longer and longer, um, life expectancy is in the high 70s, it's getting up probably into the 80s now, is that the responsibility for financing this uh, retirement, if you ever get the opportunity to retire, is going to be on you. Um, and so many financial advisors use this 4% rule, um, which is this, this idea that the amount of money you'll need in retirement is equal to uh, your annual expenses in retirement times about 25. Um, so you can safely withdraw about 4% of your savings per year. Which means that if you're going to be living on $30,000, that's still you know three quarters of a million, uh, and the numbers really just go up from there. Um, so if you can't necessarily count on Social Security, um, then really this falls to you to figure out how to raise these big numbers throughout your working years. So you know, congratulations on getting through the easy part of life. Now you gotta now you gotta deal with this. Um, so in the past. Uh, your grandparents may have had uh, the fortune of working for a company that offered a pension. Uh, and a pension is a type of plan that's called a defined benefit plan. Uh, so this blue line here is pensions. Uh, this is from 1980 to 2006, I believe. Um, and so, you know, back in the 80s, there were 60% of people had these pensions available. Now, uh, less than 10% do. Um, and when a pension, you pay into the pension while you're working, and then the company guarantees that they'll pay you a certain amount of money in retirement. Um, and this basically never happens anymore. Um, these sorts of plans have been largely supplanted um, by plans like 401k plans, which are a type of defined contribution plan, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, and basically the gist of something like the 401k is you decide how much money to put in it, and you decide what it's invested in, and the amount of money that you get out of it is entirely dependent on how those investments do and how much money you put in. Um, so again, like all the responsibility is now on you instead of on the employer. So this is a, a, a graph that I showed to some of my fellow grad students to try to convince them to start investing now. Um, and so on the x-axis here is age, and the y-axis is dollars from you know, zero to 800,000. Um, and so these different lines represent um, different situations. The blue line is a situation where you invest $5,000 per year for five years, and then you stop. And then you just see how much that has grown to at 5% per year by the time you hit 65. Um, whereas the red line is uh, waiting for five years and then starting at 5K per year. And then the green line is uh, do, uh, doing 5K the entire time. And so as you can see, even though there's, you don't actually put all that much money in in the first case, you still end up with quite a lot because this has compounded continuously. Um, and so that's really the power of compound interest. If you give it enough time to work, um, you can really accumulate um, a lot of money. Um, and so the point here is it matters not just how much you put in, but like the earlier you can get started, the better. And so uh, a lot of the people that I've worked with you know, they're starting to think about this in their 30s, and so they've already missed these good years where they're going to get the most compounding. Um, so it's a good idea to learn about this stuff so you can start 
um, contributing as soon as you're able to. So, you know, not to, not to insult your intelligence, but you can use money to get stuff. You can use your money to buy experiences, um, but you can also use your money to, to get more freedom and flexibility, um, which is really what I want to talk about today. Um, oftentimes when I work with people, they ask me how much they should be saving, how much they should be investing. And so I just show them this graph. So on the x-axis here is the percentage of your income that you're saving, and on the y-axis is the number of years it will take to completely replace your expenses with your investment earnings, um, assuming these different rates of return um, from 3 to 10%. So as I'll talk about in a future slide, um, if you look over the last 30, 40, 50 years, uh, 5 to 7% is a pretty fair rate of return on the stock market. Um, and so if you're saving, you know, 10% of your income, which is what, you know, many people would, many people do and many companies recommend, it's going to take, you know, 35 to 50 years to totally replace your, uh, replace your expenses. Though if you save a larger portion, it'll take a lot less and you'll have a lot more financial freedom. Um, and so... Another important thing to notice from this graph is that there are no, you know, absolute dollar amounts. It's all in terms of percentages. And so the real punchline here is that these, it's really these percentage rates that are more relevant than dollar amounts. Uh, because, you know, even if you have a lot of money saved, if your expenses are very high, it's not going to last you that long. So basically, you know, regardless of the amount of money you're making, it's important to save a, a good chunk of that. Um, and so, you know, especially with degrees in applied science and engineering, it becomes easier to save, you know, 30%, 40%. And that can really give you a lot of breathing room in the future. So sort of the first step towards saving money is just to figure out where all your money is going. Uh, and fortunately, there are a lot of great tools that have come out in the last couple of years for tracking your expenses. Um, both of these, uh, Mint.com and One Receipt, are free. Uh, Mint.com, you give it all of your like bank account information and your credit cards and your debit cards and investment accounts, um, and it tracks all that information and it aggregates um, all of your expenses in one place. And it actually does a pretty good job of automatically characterizing what these expenses are. Um, so then you can you can create budgets and you can track trends over time, and it's a really great tool. You can get a phone app so you can just look at it and see exactly like what all your what you owe on all your credit cards and like what's available in your bank account and it's really convenient. Um, and with one receipt you can actually scan your paper receipts or just like take a picture with your phone and uh, email it in and it gets digitized and then automatically attached um, to these individual transactions. So you can just mouse over stuff and see exactly what you bought. Um, and all of this data can be exported as a CSV file so you can do all sorts of further analysis on it. Um, and it's really cool to be able to get at all this information. Uh, another thing that I see time and time again, um, you know, more and more uh, people are graduating with a lot of debt from school, especially. Um, and oftentimes I'll work with people and they'll have, you know, 20K, 30K, you know, $70,000 in, in debt, but they won't know the interest rates and they won't know who holds the debt. Um, and so really the first step is to acknowledge that debt exists. You know, get that information in a spreadsheet. Information about how much is borrowed, how much is remaining to be paid, what the interest rate is, who's holding the loan. Um, just to sort of see that and, and, and see exactly what it's going to take to pay that off. So uh, before I talk about investing, a really common question is when you should prioritize paying down debt um, versus saving and investing. Uh, so an important thing to keep in mind is that debt is really an investment with a guaranteed rate of return. If you have a student loan and it's 6% or 7%, um, you know that if you put money towards it, that you're, you're not going to be responsible for the interest, if, you know, 6% or 7% or whatever it is in the future. And so um, if you're comparing that to returns from the stock market, um, so this graph is number of years in the stock market starting at different years from 1950 all the way to the present. And so you sort of see that in from 0 to 10 years, there, there's a very high dispersion of returns, and this is sort of all over the place. But over time, it has tended to 
average out and trend in this direction. Um, and so the long-term rates of return, at least over the last you know five decades, have been about five to seven and a half percent once you adjust for inflation. And so if you have debt that has an interest rate that's on this same order, then it makes more sense to just pay off the debt and take advantage of that reduction in interest payments than it does to sort of take the risk of investing in the markets. Um, whereas if you have debt that's lower than this, then it might make sense to split some and do some investing and do some debt pay down. Oops. So if this uh, may have given you a little bit of a heart attack if you think about your money actually jumping around like this. Um, and so this is actually a graph of the uh, S&P 500, which are 500 of the largest companies in the U.S. Um, from 1975 to the present. And so you can see where this market risk comes when, when you're investing in stocks um, because we had you know, the crash at the, at the end of the 90s and then we had another one in 08. Um, and things have been pretty good since then, but there's definitely some volatility here. Um, I really started get I really started investing in 2008. So the first thing I got to do was uh, watch 40% of my money evaporate as I invested it. Um, now since then, money that went in at the end of 2008 is now you know twice where it was then. Um, but this market risk is viscerally scary, and a lot of people don't want to get involved with investing because they they're just like too freaked out by this graph. Um, but what people often forget is that inflation isn't in, isn't scary, but it's just as dangerous. Uh, and inflation presents sort of another sort of risk. Uh, so this blue line here is a value called the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which is an index that tracks basically the cost of stuff that you need to live. Um, and so over time, the value of the dollar erodes as prices rise. Um, and so this red line is the average, um, basically, inflation rate over time. This is from, like, 1900 to the present. Um, and at least over the last couple decades, the inflation rate has been, you know, from, two, like, 2 to 3 percent on average. Um, and what that means is that if, if you have, if you're invested in cash, which has no market risk, it's still losing 2 to 3 percent of its value per year uh, just due to inflation. And so you need to take on some market risk if you're going to hope to uh, make a better return than inflation and actually deal with this inflation risk. So before I talk about investments and tax advantage investing, I need to spend at least a minute on, on taxes. Um, so you, you're probably familiar with how taxes work. Uh, there are these different brackets. And so you, you know, you see how much you make, and you pay, you know, 10% of the first 9,000, and then you pay 15% of the next 30,000, and then so on and so forth, up to your total income. Um, and so, if you if you jump a tax bracket, like let's say you make 37,450 you know, dollars, and you make one more dollar, it's not that your taxes are raised on the entire amount; you just pay the 25 on that last dollar. Um, and so, your marginal tax rate is the amount of taxes you would pay on one more dollar, um, but your average tax rate actually ends up being lower than your marginal rate. So you also pay payroll taxes. Um, and so payroll taxes actually cover Social Security and Medicare. Um, and that actually ends up being another 15%, half of which the employer pays and half of which you pay. And then there's state taxes too, which add a couple more percent to this. Uh, so in the news, you probably heard about how you know Warren Buffett pays less in taxes than his secretary does, and this is really why. Um, capital gains are uh, are taxed at a flat zero percent rate if you're in uh, the ten or fifteen percent tax bracket. It's it's and it's only fifteen all the way up to the you know four hundred thousand dollar tax bracket. And so these aren't brackets. This is actually overall. So you pay 15% on all of your capital gains if you make less than $400,000 per year in earned income. Um, and so, you know, obviously these numbers are quite a bit smaller than these numbers. And uh, that's why the taxes on investments oftentimes being less than the taxes on income. And so if you actually look at how investments are taxed, um, if, if you make interest, like in a savings account, um, that gets taxed as regular income. 
Uh, and if you if you make money from dividends, which are payouts on stocks, where a company will actually just pay the stockholders to hold the stock, um, that's taxed as income as well. Um, and if you buy a stock and you hold it for less than a year and then you sell it and it increases in value, um, that change in value is also taxed as income. But if you have what are called qualified dividends, which are dividends that are issued by certain companies in the US, um, then you pay capital gains tax on that. And also, if you hold stocks for longer than a year, you also pay this long-term capital gains value. So you're paying this value up here, probably 15% for most people. Um, and so you need to sort of understand this to understand why uh, tax-advantaged accounts are useful. So normally, an employer pays you some money, and income and payroll taxes come out of that money, and then you could take that money and you could invest it, and then as those investments grow, um, the dividends and the interests are taxed again, uh, and then when you actually cash out those investments, you pay capital gains tax on the gains. So you sort of you get taxed three separate times here. So what if I told you there's a better way? Well, you can take your money and you can put it in an offshore bank account, and then you can go to prison. Uh, so that used to work, it doesn't work anymore. Um, but there are these tax advantage investing accounts. Um, so you may have heard of the IRA, the Individual Retirement Arrangement. You've probably heard of 401ks as well. And the 401k is just one type of employer-sponsored retirement plan. Um, and so these are sort of set up and managed by your employer. Um, and then uh, some of you might even be paying for your tuition now with money from an education savings plan like a 529 plan or a Coverdell plan. And basically what all of these um, plans have in common is they reduce or eliminate some of these taxes. Uh, and so in a traditional IRA or 401k, um, you, the money you're paid, um, if you put it into a 401k plan, it doesn't get taxed as income initially. And as it's growing and there's interest and dividends on it, that's not taxed either. And it's just all taxed as income when you finally take the money back out. Um, so, you know, obviously there's some reduction in taxes here. There are also these other accounts like the Roth IRA and the Roth 401k. Um, and in this case, you pay the tax up front. So you pay all your income taxes. And then you invest that money that you've already paid taxes on. And there are no taxes on it while it's growing. And you pay no taxes when you take it back out. So obviously there's, uh, there's some tax advantage here. And so the benefit with plans like this is that there are reduction in taxes either now or in the future, um, but the trade-off is that there are restrictions on when you can take this money out. So for instance, like a traditional 401k plan, you can't get access to that money until you're 59 and a half. Um, and with something like the 529 plan, um, you only get the tax advantage if you spend the money on higher education expenses. So this is basically just, these are just laws where the government's trying to encourage you to save for education or save for retirement. Um, and you can actually see, let me see if I can bring it up here. I made a little spreadsheet where you can see the difference um, for different scenarios. So I'll share this with you uh, after class as well. And so here you can set your initial and final tax rate and your capital gains tax rate and rate of dividends and capital appreciation. And you can compare how much money you would end up with in a taxable account versus you know, different kinds of IRAs. Um, and so even for a pretty modest example like this one, you, know, you, you have four times as much as you put in 25 years later versus having five times as much. Um, and obviously, if you choosing between traditional and Roth, you're making a bet about what taxes are going to look like in the future. So you might bet that you know taxes are going to go up over time, or you'll be in a larger tax bracket, and so that all sort of depends on your on your own situation, which you would choose. Um, but this is basically what the advantage of these accounts um, are. Uh, you don't have that tax drag because you're not constantly paying taxes out of your dividends and and interest, and so that's what the invest that's what the advantage of these accounts is. Okay. So some other sort of details and advantages. Um, so when these employer-sponsored accounts, like the 401k, employers often provide matching contributions, um, which is basically no strings free money. Um, 
So oftentimes an employer will say that if you contribute up to 5% of your uh, of your salary, they will match that with 5% of like completely extra free money into the 401k. Um, and that's a great deal because that's like 100% return on investment instantly for doing nothing. Um, so the advantage of like these Roth accounts is that you can pay taxes at today's rate and then you never have to pay taxes on that money again. And like especially if you look at that social security graph, you know, taxes in the future probably going up. Um, and so especially when you're first starting out and you're paying less in taxes, you can pay those taxes now and then never have to deal with them again. Um, so in the, like these employer sponsored plan, uh, the employer chooses the brokerage firm you're working with and then you choose from like a menu of investment options that they give you. Um, and these are funded directly from your paycheck and you can contribute up to like 18,000 per year in 2015. Um, but the employer has like a lot of control over what your options are. Whereas an IRA, you actually choose the brokerage and you choose the investments. And this is funded out of your bank account up to 5K a year. Um, so you can only contribute to these accounts if you have earned income in that year. But you could literally go online right now and open up a Roth IRA. And then it would just be there when you're ready to contribute to it. There's, there's no fee associated with it or anything like that. Um, and you can invest in pretty much whatever you want in there. So I'm going to talk about uh, Vanguard, this company. Um, I mention them not because I get $10 every time I say their name or anything, um, but because they're sort of the, the leader in these low-cost investments. Um, and so a um, little bit about speculation. So when many people think about the stock market, they think about day traders who are like on their computers, trading all day, trying to time the market and do all this stuff. Um, and as it turns out, that's, that's pretty much a waste of time. Um, a better option are uh, what are called mutual funds. So all a mutual fund is, is it's an investment company that buys a selection of stocks and bonds and other stuff. And then you buy shares in this mutual fund, and then you have ownership of the mix of investments that the mutual fund holds. And now individual stocks for, for individual companies can be like a couple hundred bucks a piece. So even if you just wanted to buy, you know, one stock of, of the 500 biggest companies in the U.S., like that would cost many thousands of dollars. A mutual fund gives you an easy way to own like a little bit of everything. So yeah, this allows really easy diversification because a fund can hold hundreds or thousands of different investments. And the mutual fund manager is charged this annual management fee called an expense ratio. Um, in the bad old funds, like this might be as high as like 1% to 3%. In many modern funds, it's only 0.1% or 0.2% because it's mostly automated, run by computers. Um, and so you might think that you could pay a fund manager to try to try to beat the market and like you know pick the stocks that are going to win. It turns out that that doesn't actually work. Um, uh, this was a study that was released just this March um, in the New York Times, and they were talking about um, how many funds mutual funds actually beat the market over the long term when you calculate in the fact that their expense ratios are higher uh, because you have to pay you know, some Harvard MBA to decide what to invest in. And it turns out that after you pay those fees, uh, nobody actually beats the market. So um, the solution to this is to just buy the whole market. And you can do that uh, with an investment called an index mutual fund. Uh, and so I mentioned Vanguard also because they invented the index mutual fund. Um, and they're currently, they're actually the only nonprofit brokerage. Um, so they're, you know, way less likely to screw you. Um, and they run some of the largest mutual funds in the world. Um, so there's the Vanguard total stock. It's, it's got, you know, half a trillion dollars in it. Um, and so you can just buy shares of this single of this single thing and this has basically some of every stock that's available in the entire US stock market and then there's like an international version as well and there's like another version for bonds and so on and so forth and so this makes your life way easier because there's no need to like pick stocks and do all this other nonsense <coughs> so yeah um, if you decide to go and you know start doing some more research on your own, you're probably going to hear about ETFs, which are called exchange-traded funds. 
Um, they're very similar to mutual funds. They're just a little bit more complicated. ETFs are really good too, but I just don't have time to talk about them. So, you know, stocks and bonds, you know, what are they? How do you choose? Well, stock is partial ownership in a company. A bond is just um, a, a, like a corporate debt um, that you buy a piece of and then they pay some interest. And so stocks tend to grow more over the long term, but there's a lot more volatility, whereas bonds tend to grow slower, but they're more stable. So, you know, this started at 10, it ended up at 16. This started at 10, it ended up at 22 or 23. But, you know, it hit 8 there at some point. So um, you sort of see how that works out. And so usually what you want to do is you want to hold some of both. Um, and what you can do is you can put money in these target retirement funds, which basically, it's a fund of funds. So it holds lots of, um, it holds different index funds that hold different parts of the market. So like U.S. stocks, international stocks, U.S. bonds, international bonds, and like inflation protected stuff. And so what this does is it automatically adjusts the asset allocation to make it more conservative as you get closer to retirement. So, you know, you guys would probably be like 2060, 2065. So you just buy like target retirement 2065 and then this would automatically adjust. And uh, these funds are nice because they don't cost any extra. Like they only cost, they only pass on the cost of the funds that they hold. So this is like a great one-stop shop if you just want to like buy one thing and be done. Uh, so that's sort of all I have time to talk about investment-wise, but you sort of get the idea of what's out there. These tax-advantaged accounts are really important. Um, and uh, you sort of see how market risk and, and, and uh, inflation risk work. So now I'll talk a little bit about credit score. <clears throat> so the first thing to know is how, uh, so your, your credit score is a number that's calculated based on your credit history. And it's a number from 350 to 850 on some scales. Uh, but an important thing to know is that there are an infinite number of ways that your credit score can be calculated. There are all these different scales and all these different methods. Um, but companies use the credit score to try to decide how risky it is to give you more money. Um, and they'll use factors like, uh, so these numbers I'm going to show you are the factors for a score called the, the Fair Isaac Corporation score, uh, the FICO score, which is the most popular one. And it looks at things like your payment history, your credit utilization ratio, your credit age, types of credit, and also number of recent credit inquiries. So I'll talk a little bit about these. Um, so obviously, if you're trying to figure out if someone's going to pay you back in the future, whether they've paid you back in the past is probably a pretty good measure of that. So payment history is always the most important factor. Um, credit utilization ratio is some, something that people oftentimes get wrong. Uh, people often think that if they open a bunch of credit cards, it's going to hurt their credit, when actually, over the long term, it's going to help it. Uh, because the your credit utilization ratio is the amount of credit you use versus the total amount of credit you have. And the optimum ratio is actually close to 10%. Um, and so, optimally, you'll have 10 times more credit than you use, because people in that situation, when you give them more credit, they don't tend to overspend if they're not overspending already. So, you know, all of these weightings are just decided by statistical analysis of who pays their bills and who doesn't. Um, but actually, having more credit is a good thing. Um, credit age is just like the average age of all of your accounts. And so, obviously, you know, having been around for longer is a good thing. Um, there are different types of credit, like mortgages and car loans and everything else. And the more different types of credit you have, the better. And also, so recent credit inquiries. If, if you apply for credit, it's actually going to temporarily drop your credit rating um, because people know you're shopping around for credit. And so statistically, if someone adds a whole bunch of credit all at once, they're more likely to spend more than they can pay for. Um, but it turns out credit inquiries only affect your credit for one year. So you could like apply for a new credit card every year and it wouldn't really hurt you. Um, so there's a trend that's going on right now where a lot of, uh, especially a lot of young people are ditching credit cards. So us like under 30 people have like the fewest credit cards of anyone ever. Um, and so you might think this is a good thing because carrying credit card debt is really, really bad uh, because the interest rate on this stuff is oftentimes like 18 to 30%. 
Um, but you have to sort of watch out for this debit card trap. Um, it turns out that using debit cards and having debit cards, like, that doesn't contribute at all to your credit score. And so you can end up in a situation where you're, like, starting your first job and you don't have any credit history at all. And that can actually make it difficult to get more credit. It can make it difficult to even rent in some places, in expensive places like the Bay Area. Um, so it's actually a really good idea to get a credit card and just pay it off in full every month instead of using a debit card. You can even set these things up to pay automatically. Um, it's also it's worth your time to like check your credit history and make sure there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, once per year, you can actually get your free uh, annual credit reports, um, annualcreditreport.com, and you can just make sure there's like nothing weird, nothing wrong with it. Um, and then there are a bunch of different companies that offer free credit scores, um, and you can at least watch those and like you know, make sure that nothing too weird is going on. And you can see how the choices that you make influence your, your quantitative score. <coughs> so the last thing I wanted to talk about um, was uh, basically that, you know, you need to go out and, and you need to learn more because many things that you just sort of assume to be true um, are probably not true. And also, you know, you probably shouldn't trust anyone over the age of 30 when they try to give you financial advice because um, that generation doesn't have nearly enough safe for retirement, so they don't have any idea what they're talking about. Um, but pretty much everyone over the age of 30 will tell you that um, no investment is better than real estate. You know, the best thing you can invest in is to just buy a house. And uh, if you actually look at the data, that's just not true. Um, so if you look back to 1900, um, real estate has returned 0% once you adjust for inflation. And over the last 15 years, it's only returned 3%, which is way worse than stocks and worse than bonds and like worse than pretty much anything. So if you actually take the time to do the math um, of buying versus renting and calculate the average annual cost savings, um, it really depends on your scenario, whether you're going to be saving money by buying or saving money by renting. Um, where people will screw you up is they'll show you a graph like this, where you look at buying versus renting, where you know renting is red, buying is blue. And you look at this and you say, oh, you know, once you've paid off the house, then you don't have to pay rent anymore, so obviously it's better to buy. But if you take into account the opportunity cost of being invested in a mortgage and you neglect the fact that you have to pay insurance, you pay property taxes, you pay maintenance, and all of this other stuff, the graph actually ends up looking like this, um, where depending on how the parameters work out, these values actually end up being pretty similar. And so it's definitely worth your time uh, you know, any time you encounter, in, you know, this these truisms and this advice that, you know, everyone knows real estate is a great investment, it's a good idea to do some more research and actually dig into the numbers yourself um, because oftentimes these truisms are just, they're not true. And so the real way to protect yourself against this kind of stuff is to just learn as much as you can. Um, and so there are a lot of great resources out there for getting smarter. Um, Stack Exchange, which sort of started in computer science related stuff, now has a really good money and personal finance um, exchange where people ask all kinds of questions and they get voted up and down. Um, actually, even our personal finance isn't bad at all. Um, there's like a lot of good stuff posted in here. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, you wouldn't go on Yik Yak for medical advice, so, you know, you gotta, this guy is gonna start living in his car and he's looking for advice, um, so, you know, you might wanna. <laughs> You might want to take all the advice you find on Reddit with a grain of salt. Um, but there's still a lot of really great resources out there. Um, there's also, you know, it's, it's a great wiki with a funny name. It's uh, the Bogleheads wiki. It's a whole bunch of investors. Um, it's a great resource. Uh, Mr. Money Mustache is an engineer who retired at the age of 30 with a million dollars. Um, his website's really funny, and uh, he has some great advice. And then I, this is actually my own website where I post about finance-related stuff, and I have a wiki and stuff as well. Um, but, uh, you know, you're at Penn State as well. Uh, I know that there are personal finance courses that are offered, and I know that the demand for them is really high, but you might try to, you know, take one of those as well and learn more about all this different stuff. So with that, if I have any questions... 
me see if I can get the audio. Okay, well, you're definitely muted, so I can't hear you. Um, but if you do have any questions, um, don't hesitate to find me on my website uh, or send me emails. So they're both listed here. It's just brandoncurtis.com, brandoncurtis at gmail.com. Um, and if you have any questions whatsoever, I would be very happy to answer them.